So I'm here today to talk about the future of customer service. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, just a brief uh, info about me. I run the employee and customer success teams at JustWorks for a platform for payroll and benefits and HR for small businesses. We good with next here, guys? No. Oh, there it is. So I wanted to start with a Mad Lib. This is something from my generation. I'm a Gen Xer. The future of customer service puts blank at the center of your service strategy. Anybody want to guess? Me? So someone said end user. So the traditional philosophy on this Mad Lib is that the customer is the, fu is the center of the customer service strategy. Every traditional service book that you'll read says this, teaches us this. And I'm here today to say the future of your customer service strategy has very little to do with your actual customers. Uh, there are some new books out there that push data as the future of customer service, that you should focus on data, that you should look at metrics, that you should look at the productivity of your team as the future of customer service. That's what you should be focused on. And while data is great and is a great indicator of service success, it should not be the focus of your strategy. So today I'm here to say that employees are actually the focus of the future of customer service. And let's talk about why that is. So the philosophy that we've been working with is that employee happiness is paramount to the future of customer service. It affects everything that happens with your customers. If your employees have an amazing experience in your organization, or if you work somewhere and you have an amazing experience, when you interact with customers and clients, they'll also have an amazing experience. And if they have an amazing experience, then that affects the brand, it elevates the brand. The users tweet and post and talk about the brand in a positive way. But if the employee experience isn't amazing, everything else falls apart. And again, the history of customer service literature and writing and research and books tell us to focus in the middle. But if you start in the middle, you can't be successful with your customers and with your brand elevation. So I'm here to say that we focus on the employee experience first. That elevates the customer experience, and that elevates the brand perception of the company. I was interviewing, I started at JustWorks about two months ago, and I was interviewing with another company, and I talked about this philosophy. And the executive who I was meeting with had no concept of this. She said, I spend all my time talking to customers. I spend all my time thinking about customers. I spend all my time traveling to the customer. And I said, well, when do your employees get your attention? When do they get your focus? When do they get your love? When do they feel good about working at your company? And she said, that's a really great idea. But she had never thought that way before. She had never considered that before. And so it is a radical concept. Again, the books tell you otherwise. But there's one book that I wanted to just read a quick excerpt from, and I know you didn't come here thinking that it was going to be a read-along today. But it's an amazing book by a guy named Ben Horowitz. He's a venture capitalist. And he talks about this, maybe not intentionally, but he talks about this. So I wanted to just read an excerpt with you. So the context of this excerpt is that he's talking to an employee, a manager of his, who hasn't had one-on-ones with his employees for months. So literally this manager hasn't talked to his employees about how they're doing, how they're feeling, what their career path looks like in months. And so he sits down this executive and they have a conversation. So Ben says, I come to work because it's personally very important to me that our company be a good company. It's important to me that the people who spend 12 to 16 hours a day here, which is most of their waking life, have a good life. It's why I come to work. Steve, the executive says, okay. Steve doesn't do too well in this conversation, as you can imagine. Ben says, do you know the difference between a good place to work and a bad place to work? And Steve says, um, I think so. And Ben says, what's the difference? And Steve doesn't know. So Ben says, let me break it down for you. In good organizations, people can focus on their work and have confidence that if they get their jobs done, good things will happen for both the company and them personally. It is a true pleasure to work in an organization such as this. Every person can wake up knowing that the work they do will be efficient, effective, and make a difference for the organization and themselves. These things make their jobs both motivating and fulfilling. So Ben, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, figured it out. It's about the employees first, then customers, and then brand.
Thanks. I want to talk a little bit about the nomenclature of these things, the nomenclature of people and of service. And I look back in the history, and we talk about things like HR, which is very backroom operations, benefits, paperwork, very invisible to the outside world. There's an executive at Google named Laszlo Bach. You may have read his book. He renamed the function people operations. Now, everyone and every company wants to turn HR into people operations. I don't love people operations because it's still very behind the scenes. It's still very back room. Operations to me says, let's look at the data, but not really at the individual people. So at JustWorks, we actually renamed HR employee success, which is very focused on making the employees successful. It's very clear what the objective is. We know what we're there to do. And it's moving HR out of the back room and into the forefront to say it's our job to help employees be successful. But customer service has had the same evolution. When I think about customer service, I think about retail environments, uh, B2C, very operational, a cost center, something that you manage but you don't really think about. Lately, that's moved into something called customer experience. And what customer experience, or CX says, which is a very sexy term right now, is look at the data. Focus on the data. Are your employees working, enough, working hard enough, making enough customer touch points, which is great, but it isn't really about the actual customer experience. It's too passive. It's too much in the background. And so we focus on customer success. And the recent move that we made was to bring these two things together. Let's make it employee success and customer success so that if our employees are happy and doing the right things, then our customers will see that and will experience that. So we feel like this is an evolutionary change and a new way to think about how to make customers happy. Uh, I want to tell you guys a quick story. These are two executives that run a company here in New York called Hell Alfred. I don't know if anyone's heard of Hell Alfred. Uh, this is Marcella and Jess. They started this company in Boston originally and then moved it to New York. It's a company that provides service for the on-demand economy. So when you think about all the things that are happening in your lives that you need to get done, pick up your laundry from the laundromat, stock your shelves in your apartment, clean your apartment, they service that. So they actually have people come into your homes and do things like laundry, cleaning, uh, stocking your shelves. So they come into your, into your house, which is a very intimate thing. And they have hundreds of these folks who they call Alfreds all over New York, and they're breaking into new cities as well, to really serve the on-demand economy. This is in-person service. So their business itself is service. What they deliver is service 100% of the time. And when these folks come into your homes, they're touching your clothes. They're looking at your food. It's a very intimate thing. And what they could have done to start, to start this business is hire a bunch of contractors, right? Hire a bunch of people who they could pay hourly, wouldn't have to provide benefits, wouldn't really have to worry about their experience because that was the easiest, fastest, cheapest way to scale the business. But they chose specifically not to do that. They actually chose to make every single employee, every single Alfred, a W-2 full-time or part-time employee who's eligible for benefits and can really generate a career and build a career path at Hello Alfred. Um, this came out a little bit blurry, but when an Alfred goes into your home, every single time they interact with your apartment, they leave a handwritten note. And they say, this is what I did. I stocked your shelves, I picked up your laundry, I put things away, I fed your dog, I fed your cat, and they leave that handwritten note. And so what Mar Marcella and Jess said was that for the future of our company, we need these people to be invested in Hello Alfred. We need them to be full-time employees. We need them to have an amazing experience. And if they're contractors, they're not going to have that. If we don't give them benefits, if we don't give them health care, if they don't have 401k opportunities, then they can't do that. And the two executives estimated that doing this costs them 15 to 20% more to run their business than if they would have used contractors. But they feel like they're contributing to the economy of New York City. They feel like they're building the careers of these people. And that was important to them. So this is a perfect example of where focusing on the employee first is contributing directly to the customer experience, where the customers of Hell Alfred get to know their Alfreds. They have relationships with their Alfreds. And when a customer has to switch Alfreds, they often get really upset. I talked to Marcella and Jess about this. When they have a chance, I said, what happens when the Alfred like, gets promoted? or quits, or does something else at Hello Alfred, what happens? And they said customers can get really upset, and we have to like, go there and be very, carefully, be very careful on how we transition one to the other. 
And so it's important that these folks be full-time employees and have a great experience and have benefits. I want to talk a little bit about call centers very quickly before I finish up. All of you have probably heard about call center work. It's a really tough job. It's one of the worst jobs out there. Taking hundreds of calls a day, it's, a, it's really hard work. This is the call center at Zappos. Everybody knows Zappos, the shoe company. Um, they're out in Las Vegas. They've chosen to staff their entire call center in Las Vegas. So they don't have people in other countries. They don't have people in other regions. They're focused on the economy of Las Vegas and building the economy of Las Vegas, supporting folks in Las Vegas, employing people in Las Vegas. They built their whole call center there. And this is what it looks like. It's literally insane. The only thing that they have to have is their name tag, which you can see some of them hanging from the ceiling. Other than that, they can do whatever they want. They can dress it up however they want. They can build walls around it. They can put up stickers and posters. They can have whatever experience they want. Because Zappos is saying, our employees come first. Your experience come fir comes first. We know this job is really hard. We know taking hundreds of calls a day and a week is really hard. So do it, make it look like whatever you want. And if you think about traditional call centers, they're very small cubicles. You sit right next to your teammate and your friend. You all day sit there, take calls and take calls and take calls, and it looks like a white wall. This is something completely different. And they chose to do this. They chose to make this feel different. They chose to make this customer experience different. The other thing they do is they have no requirements about what types of calls people have. They've had calls that are hours and hours long. Traditional call centers say you have to have a call finished in a certain amount of time because you have to move on to the next one. Because if you don't move on to the next one, we don't meet our metrics and we're not profitable. Not focused on the employee experience. So I wanted to bring up some stats real quick about call centers. The traditional call center pays minimum wage. I actually interviewed someone the other day at JustWorks for our team. She literally makes minimum wage in New York City working in a call center. She could work at McDonald's and make the exact same rate, but she's working in a corporate job taking calls as a customer service agent, making $10.50 an hour. So in an employee-focused call center, either at Zappos or JustWorks or Discover or the different companies that are pioneering this space, they're paying usually double or more minimum wage. So they're elevating what a call center job is like. Also, talk scripts. Uh, I interviewed someone the other day who said, I answer the phone, and a little menu pops up, and I just say what's on the menu. That's her existence. That's her career, is reading a menu off of a computer screen. And that's true in so many different call centers. At Zappos, or in my company, or in other companies, there's no talk scripts. You know what you need to say because we train you properly, but you can be yourself. You can have a personality. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about someone's pets, if they have a dog or a cat. If their kid is having a birthday next week, you can talk about that. And it makes it feel like real life. I don't know how many of you have called into companies and it feels very robotic. It feels like not a real person that you're talking to. Uh, I built a 150 person call center at my last company, Indeed.com, the job site. And we told them, you can talk about whatever you want. Ask customers about the weather. And I would see notes in our CRM that would say, call Susie back because it's her birthday next week. Call centers don't normally do that. But we did that because it made an amazing customer experience and it allowed the employees to be themselves and act like themselves and have personalities and be real. Uh, talk time I min mentioned, usually you have to talk for a certain amount of time, you can't go over that. Again, at Zappos they have calls that are hours long. At my last company, my new company, we've had calls that go on for a long time because that's what it takes to help the customer. Uh, data in most call centers are life and death. There's a little timer up on the wall that says you need to hang up in a certain number of seconds or you're gonna get in trouble. Everything is driven by data. If you read any article about call center effectiveness, the first thing they talk about is data, not are your employees happy? Do they enjoy where they work? Are they going to stay? Can you improve turnover better than 40%? And so we have no talk times. We look at data. It's a healthy guide for how things are going, but you don't live and die based on the data. Call abandonment in a traditional call center is almost, it's pushing 10%. In an employee-focused call center, employees want to answer the phone because it's fun. They can be themselves. They can actually help customers. They don't dread it. And so people drop off less frequently in an employee-focused call center. And then attrition in a call center job is the worst. Typically, 40% can be even higher. In an employee-focused environment, Zappos, Indeed, where I worked, it was less than that. I was 6% at Indeed. So you can get under 10% employee attrition by focusing this way. So it's an entire paradigm shift of what has been done historically in service and especially in an environment like a call center to say, if you put your employees first, they'll have an amazing experience, customers will have an amazing experience, and it will elevate your brand. When people call Zappos and ask them, can you order me a pizza? 
They do it. They've done it. It happens. So it's real life. Uh, last slide for me. I also wanted to mention that some metrics that have been traditionally used on the consumer side are now being used on the employee side. So I don't know if you, ever, if you guys have ever taken a survey that says, would you recommend this company to a friend or to a colleague? I think everybody's taken one of those, right? Companies use that. It's called Net Promoter Score or NPS, and it gives them a baseline for how their company is doing. How is we performing with customers? And they follow that. They cut it up, slice it and dice it over time to see, are they making customers happy? It's a very traditional metric. One thing I did at Indeed, I said, well, we use this every day with customers. Why aren't we using it with employees? And so we sent out a, question, a survey question to employees that was literally just one question. Would you recommend Indeed to a friend or a colleague as an employee? You work here. Would you recommend it as a place to work to your friends or your colleagues? And we started using MPS as our guide for employee success along with customer success. And there are other metrics that are being modified this way. Uh, lifetime value is a common one in business. You look at a customer's lifetime value. How much revenue do they contribute to the business? But you can also look at employee lifetime value. What is the employee contributing to the business? So a lot of these metrics that have traditionally been used as consumer metrics now are being flipped on their head as well and being used as employee metrics, which is really interesting. So my message today, again, going back to my chart, employee first, then customer, then brand. Uh, that's the future of customer service. Thanks, everybody.